Um, hi everyone, as I said, my name is Linda and um, I am here today with uh, Disabled in Higher Ed to talk about being an ally to um, those with disability in academia and higher education. So um, to start, who are Disabled in Higher Ed? We're a new movement for people with disabilities or disabled people and uh, we want to highlight, celebrate and empower. Um, whoever is in higher education with disabilities. But we also want to create awareness and inform allies of what they can be doing. That's, uh, well, how to be better and um, how they can support. So um, at the moment we are organizing for next month um, via Twitter, a kind of a month of celebration to empower all of our disabled people, no matter what level or country that they are. Um, and we want to kind of tell stories, but also give not only knowledge to people with disabilities about how they can best represent themselves, but also talk about the barriers that people face and um, I guess also ableism and discrimination that people will face in higher education. So um, the first thing to say is what is disability? Um, the best I guess definition is the CDC definition and it's any condition of the body and mind that causes impairment, activity limitation or participation restrictions. So this is a very wide scope. Um, there are many different things that this encompasses and um, disability is kind of seen as the ultimate intersectional identity because it doesn't discriminate. You can be anyone and like, as this conference has shown, we talk about a lot of different identities. You can have any of the identities that this conference talked about. You can be a gender minority, you can be a sexual minority, you can be a woman, race, you can be an ethnic minority and you can still be disability. All of these issues are disability issues as well. And another thing that we would be talking about is that disability is not a one-time thing. So um, people can be born disabled, people can become disabled, and people can be born with something that does not, that is a degenerative, degenerative disability. So it can kick in or become worse later in life. And there are many different types of disabilities about how they affect people and uh, their limitations of all of how they affect the person themselves. So um, this first poll is um, ah, the first poll is there at the side for you, and it's um, sorry, it's how much of the world's population is estimated to have a disability, and um, there are four options. So this is from the the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, because it is. Um, and um, I guess for a lot of people, they don't really know, but there are so many different disabilities. And given the definition I have just given you, um, you can see that it is much wider than people usually assume. So the actual answer is about 15%. And this is an estimated answer because A, we don't really know um, people can feel free not to disclose a disability, and that is absolutely fine. But also when we were talking about certain countries, um, some disabilities just aren't diagnosed, which is um, another issue in itself. Um, so disability is often seen as the forgotten minority because when we are talking about equality, diversity and inclusion, we often forget to mention disability. So looking at the stats, um, there's not a lot of statistics that we can draw on. So from the UK, uh, this is a statistic from 2017, um, there were 3.9% academic staff in the UK. And in the US, there were 3.6% of academic staff or tenured professors, but that is a statistic from 2004. So we don't actually know what the current um, percentage of disabled professors or even academic staff in academia is. We honestly have no idea. They haven't done anything since. And oftentimes um, for people, the world is built for abled people, for non-disabled people. 
and people with disabilities are often seen they should be so grateful that they are given minimum accommodations that anything is done for them so even when they ask for something that they really need it's seen as an inconvenience or it's seen that they're being ungrateful for what they are being given because in this world it is seen that it is optional to give people with disabilities anything and one thing we talk about is accessibility in higher education and academia accessibility is seen as time consuming and it's unnecessary or optional people don't have to do it they only do it if they want to and if they want to they deserve an award for it um so the leaky pipeline is a, a diagram that we're very used to seeing when we talk about minorities or marginalized communities in academia and um this is not a true result because the pipeline for disabilities is not closed. As I said, um, you can become disabled at any point in your life. So these statistics are not representative. We do not know whether the people who are staying in academia were disabled and came through the um, academic structure and the academic system as people with disabilities or if they became true it as an abled person and then became disabled because while these are two very different perspectives and they're both valid coming through the system as an abled person and becoming disabled doesn't actually tell us anything about barriers in the system to disabled people and um these stats themselves these are actually us stats but these stats are the most informative stats in the world because they have the least missing data so if we look at 26 percent 26 percent is the cdc's version of how much uh, how many people in the us have a disability 19 percent is the percentage of undergrads that are registered in the us that have a disability and then eight and seven percent are the masters and phd students respectively the next stat we have is the 3.6 of tenured professors we have no idea the amount of disabled people after PhDs. There is no stats, but even these stats are not representative because they are all from different years. The 26% um, is a current statistic, but the 19% is from 2012. The eight and seven are from 2009. And as I said earlier, the 3.6 is from 2004. So we actually don't, we're not able to build a full picture because there's not the literature out there. Like we just, honestly, there is very little research being done on this. So we don't really know. And um, one massive barrier in academia is ableism. And this is something that everyone experiences who has a disability, regardless of what their disability is. So. You can see on the screen there's a bit of a there we made a word cloud and it is in the shape of a speech bubble and there are 33 different negative words that are associated with disability as discriminatory so these have either these were questions that we asked um disabled people who are in academia either as staff faculty or as students and these were the answers that we were given um, so some examples, they're all negative words. They, they were seen as an inconvenience that they are pretending to be disabled. They're not disabled enough. They're useless, helpless, undeserving. They're a liability. They're faking or they're exaggerating that they're, they're lazy. They don't want to do it. They're unmotivated. The fact that they're asking for these accommodations is because not because they can't do it because they don't want to. And that is very much seen as if like that's that's the story that every person with a disability has in in academia everyone talks about it and um i guess to talk from a personal perspective because as i said there's very little research in this area um i have certainly got all of these at some point from some person but for me, I still have a lot of privilege over a lot of disabled people because I am white and I am, I have invisible disabilities. So unless I tell you 
or I'm having a really bad day, people don't know that I'm disabled. And I have that privilege over other people. But when I tell people, it usually means that I'm seen as being, as I am pretending, that I'm saying that there's something wrong with me when there isn't. And that I am just being lazy and I could do this if I wanted to, but I don't want to. And that is the experience that makes people feel isolated and not want to stay in academia, even though um, disabled people are some of the best problem solvers in the world because they grow up in a society and an environment that is not built for them. They have to problem solve every single day just to deal with the world. And um, being a better ally is there's many different ways to do it. One of the first ways is to include the disabled in the conversation. Many people, when they talk about disability, is they talk to disability experts, but that's not the same thing. Disability experts, disability studies and disability experts started um, in eugenics. They didn't start with trying to understand disabled people. And that is why, as someone who has autism, I've often heard that I have no empathy, which isn't true. Um, you can tackle your ableism and call out others. If you are someone who can design a lab um, to amazing places to start, looking as how you can do that, um, our accessible campus.ca, which is a Canadian website. And there is also a virtual tour of Purdue's accessible lab called ABLE. Um, if you, again, if you are someone who is in a position of power, you can ensure research accommodations. Many of the accommodations that university gives are just for exams and classes. They don't extend into the lab, or even if they extend into the lab, they don't extend after graduation. But disabilities don't disappear after you graduate. They still exist. And a lot of faculty and staff don't feel they can ask for them because they're told that if they do, again, they're being lazy. They're not trying and you can make your own work accessible which is something that absolutely everyone can do regardless of your position or your power is that you can choose to make the work you are producing as part of your whatever you're doing whether it's documents whether it's presentations whether it's your social media you can make it accessible to people with disabilities not too it's not too difficult when you look into it it looks like a lot because as i said we don't have an accessible society and there's a lot of things we are doing that are not accessible. But once you start investigating this and implementing it into your own work in your own life, it's actually quite easy to keep up because it's not that difficult. And um, tackling ableism is easier said than done. As with any bias, it takes time and there you are going to make mistakes. But one way you can start is inclusive language, making sure that you're not losing slurs and also stop using phrases which are sometimes rooted in different languages and it can depend on your language that are anti-disability. In English, an example of this would be people saying, oh, are you blind instead of when people are not paying attention? Those are two different things. And asking disability instead, dis disabled people instead of disability researchers. There is starting to become a crossover between disability researchers and disabled people because more disabled people are going into disability research. But it's not, sometimes it's not the same thing. When we talk about disability, we often talk about children, which is an important conversation to have, but it doesn't tell us anything about people with disabilities because we are hearing it from the perspective of doctors. We are hearing it from the perspective of parents. And those are views, but those are massively ableist views because they haven't lived this life and they have no idea. When you are talking to disabled people, you are actually hearing about these experiences and actual personal views. They're much more valuable. So, one way to make your own work more um, accessible is to use universal design or its equivalent. So there's a couple of different um, frameworks 
to make things more accessible. And universal design is probably the most used. Um, so the point of universal design is to make, is to build accessibility into your design, not to think about it afterwards or when someone complains, but actually when you're making it. And this can apply to anything. As I said, this can apply to your own work, any documents you're producing, any labs you're designing, any projects you're making, any classes that you're that you're making for a college for college, even your social media, everything. And the point of universal design is that it makes things accessible for everyone, regardless of age, disability, or any other factor. So it doesn't just um, benefit people with disabilities, it benefits everyone. And there are three main things that access that accessible by design means. It means that everyone can access it, and you can see a picture of a lock, open lock there. Everyone can understand it, and there's a bit, little thumbs up, and everyone can interact or use it as they're meant to. And there is a little hand that's tapping on a board. So um, some terms that are often used with accessibility that many people may not know, um, alt text or alternative text. And this is where we give a text description of an image for anyone who can't see it. But it's very important that this is meaningful. So you kind of have to think, if I couldn't see this image, what would I want to know about it? Um, camel case, which is for hashtags when you're using them on social media. And this is where you capitalize the first letter of each hashtag. And that is, or each word in the hashtag. And that is because people who use screen readers can't, screen readers are technology. They only do what we tell them to do. And screen readers, can't understand a word if it's not capitalized or spaced out. So with hashtags, if you don't capitalize the words, it thinks it's all one word that it doesn't know and it reads it out letter by letter. And that's fine for maybe one word. But if you have a hashtag that's composed of several words, you've no idea what what is being said. It's just a bunch of letters. Um, captions are for videos. So it's a general term for subtitles, which is just the words that are being said, and close ca closed captions, which include the words that are being said, and also your um, say, so also nonverbal cues. So if I was to shout, you would put shout in the closed captions, but you wouldn't put it in the subtitles. You'd just put what I was shouting in the subtitles. And as I said, screen readers are assistive technology that are used by the visually impaired, but also by those who are have cognitive disabilities. So I would use a screen reader if I have a lot of work to do because I'm dyslexic and I don't read that well. And it can sometimes give me a headache, but it's also much faster to have a screen reader read it for me. And um, then the final one is a transcript. So a transcript is an unsynchronized unsynchronized text description of multimedia material. So that is sort of where you put your closed captions onto a separate document. And one way you can do this, transcripts are required for infographics, for videos, and for podcasts. Also, um, if we were to record a lecture, anything like that. And it's separate. It's a document that you would give with it, and it gives all of your information so that someone could basically read it or have a screen reader read it and they would know what's going on without a video or without the the audio they can still understand it so um for your own documents this is just a basic overview there's a lot of different things you can do um is to use headings so you can set your headings in microsoft word or in um Google Docs or whatever you're using. You can make it a heading and not just write it as a heading because a screen reader doesn't know the difference between something that is a slightly bigger font and something that's not. It just thinks it's another part of the sentence that has ended up on a different line. So if you use your headings, it knows to pause. And it can be much easier to navigate the document. For readability, you can use sans serif fonts or Times New Roman as they are much easier to read for people with dyslexia and other cognitive disabilities. You can make sure everything is spaced out. And this is a minimum of 1.5 is what is recommended by the British Dyslexia Association. 
you can always make sure that you give alternative text or if it's not needed, you can mark images as, de as decorative um, in documents or presentations. So for example, the logo that is on every single slide, I marked it as decorative, so I didn't need to give an alt text because when a screen reader is going through something, it reads absolutely everything. And even though it's there, it doesn't need to be read on every slide. And um, also you can give a table of contents if they're over 10 pages of document because it makes it much easier to navigate. If you go onto the web version of Google Docs or on um, uh, Word, even the web version, your table of contents turns into links so that you can skip to parts of a document, especially if you're reviewing it. It makes it much easier to navigate. And one thing to point out is to be very careful of tables because tables can, can really confuse screen readers and they can also be difficult to read if they're not formatted properly. Um, and so the second poll up there is, do you know how to write alternative text? Um, so for me, this is a question that I decided to ask because personally, I didn't really know how to approach writing alternative text. And a lot of the guides that are out there just say write alternative text. Um, there are some really nice guides, um, but they're hard to find. And sometimes you can be looking at a really complex image and you're like, what, how, do I, how do I approach this? How do I even start? And um, so a simple guide is if it's a picture, who or what is in it? Is their identity important? So if it was a picture of a committee, is it important to say who they are? Is what is the point of the image? Do we want to convey the identity of these people? Do we want to point out something they're wearing? Do we want to find out where they're doing? Is it like an event? Is it a wedding? Is the location important? Are we on a trip and it's a picture over a valley or we went on a hike? And is the description of the location important? So you don't need to describe everything in the picture, but what are you trying to get across? Why are you using this picture? Um, and it's the same kind of for figures and graphs. It's why are you using this? What is this telling that the text alone couldn't? Um, and also, um, we would also say, what kind of, of graph is it? Is it a bar chart? Is it a scatter plot? And for anyone who uses OR, ggplot2 has um, particular codes that you can use to make um, colorblind friendly graphs. So a lot of people will use red and blue or red and green, which is very confusing. and people with color blindness can't distinguish it. So use other colors if you can, but there are specific codes that you can use for OR to make sure that any of the graphs produced are not colorblind affected of colors. And if you were doing something like an infographic or a graphic where you give a lot of information, all of your text must be included in either the alt text or linked on a transcript if it's too long. So some new it's kind of being made recently that a lot of programs are auto generating all text but to be honest this isn't really good at the moment anyway um so facebook alt and instagram auto generate some of their alt text and microsoft does as well but it is a computer and computers the, the reason we have alt text is computers can't really um, process images. This is why we need to write a description. So when I was making this presentation, we see that um, the recommend or the automatically generated description of the open lock that I used a couple of slides ago was a close up of a hanger, which is nothing similar and can make a really nice information, a really nice report, a really nice presentation mean no sense to someone who can't see this to know that it's wrong. So that's kind of it. Thank you.